guess I'm not gonna have speaker notes. But has anyone here realized before that if you if you are a software engineer, you make about twenty thousand dollars a year more than if you're a software developer. Uh, it's a very similar job, very differently paid. Now, what about cholera? We know, we know these days that cholera spreads through water, right? But in the 19th century, they thought it was spread through smog until this dude, John Snow, made a visualization and saw that the closer you are to a poisoned well, the more likely you are to have cholera. Which is curious. And somebody at Autodesk made an interesting experiment where they took random data and made sure that it has the same average, mean, and all the other statistical values, even though sometimes it renders a dinosaur. So where all those three things, what all those three things have in common is that you need to, date, you need to visualize your data to really understand what's going on, to see what you're actually looking for. You need data visualization because making a picture uses one of the biggest centers in your brain, which is the visual sense, and you can then see things you, didn't, you sometimes didn't even know you were looking for. Uh, like for instance, seeing that if you call yourself an engineer, you're gonna make more, more money than if you call yourself a programmer, which I think is useful for everyone in this room. Um, <laughs> at least I hope it is. Just make sure never call, you can call yourself programmers to your friends. If you're talking to somebody who's giving you money, you are an engineer. <laughs> um, so D3JS, who here has heard of D3JS before? Wonderful, almost everyone. D3JS is this really cool project. It's open source, it's been out since 2011 or something. And it is the best library out there for making data visualizations. Pretty much anything you've seen on the internet that is a data viz is probably D3. The New York Times uses it, especially because the creator of D3 was employed by the New York Times for a really long time. The Guardian uses it. All the big data journalist guy, people use it. Um, and in general, it's, it can do pretty much anything. It's, if you think of jQuery as the, I mean, I'm sure we know jQuery, right? Everyone knows jQuery? Perfect. D3 is like the jQuery of data viz. It's this low level library that lets you do anything you want take some data, put it to the DOM, and you can make a beautiful visualization that renders in SVG, you can render it in Canvas. It works everywhere, and it's just amazing. And one thing that I was surprised about when I found out is that D3 is actually almost as big as React. It has 73,000 stars on GitHub, whereas React only has 91,000. Um, now think about this, React is made by Facebook, it is this amazing library that we all love to use to make our front ends. It's used by all the big tech giants. And this lowly D3 library that only does data visualization has almost as many stars on GitHub. I, th I think that's pretty crazy when you, when you think about it. And it's only, I think it's only two years older when you look at the total lifespan. So it's really big and it's really great. Um, yeah. D3 is basically the best thing out there you can use. There's, there's a lot of libraries built on top of D3 that you can use. We're not gonna talk about those today. Those usually, uh, they use D3 on the, on the low level somewhere and it's generally taken over the market. But D3 has this problem where, I don't know how many, I guess half of you raised your hand. So you've tried D3 before, which means you know that it's almost impossible to read code written with D3. I don't want you to try reading this. It's just, it's not even a screenshot. It's a copy pasted code from an official example. And I'm sure that every one of you here can look at this for five seconds and tell me that it renders a bar chart, right? Yeah? <laughs> uh, don't worry, I wrote, I've written two books about D3 and I would not be able to tell you this is a bar chart. It does all sorts of weird things. It's messy code. Most of the examples you find out there were written as like, one-off projects that somebody did as art was just an example. They use a bunch of global variables. They use chained code that spaghetti is on forever. And this, this sort of code is generally a mess to read. Um, there's a couple of key insights that you have to kind of grok to really understand, be able to understand this kind of code. But we're gonna be focused on React instead. 
Uh, this, is, this, by the way, is what the previous code renders. Totally obvious, right? Um, so you can make D3 better if you combine it with React, because React, as we all know, gives you reusability, componentability, componentizability, components. Um, it makes your code readable. You can come back to it six months from now, or another team member, team member can come, and they say, oh, this is a bar chart component, because it says this is a bar chart. And I'm going to show you a couple of demos. Let's see if this works. So uh, these demos, by the way, are all built with React and D3. They are not practical, but I think they demo pretty well and look shiny. So this is something, this is, uh, this, I actually built this before I knew about Redux. It's using Flux. And it is a Space Invaders game where you can shoot at these little orbs and you can die. And it's very, <laughs> and it is surprisingly easy to die and very difficult to win. I don't think I've ever finished it. Um, another cool one is you can push React and D3 together to render 20 or 25,000 particles on the screen at the same time that are all individually animated and moving around all the, on their own. And I tested this on a three-year-old iPhone, and it still goes up to about 18,000, which I think is just bonkers. Um, I mean, th this is rendered on Canvas, and I did a lot of weird tricks to make it this fast, but you can do it. And uh, the idea is that if you re-render your React, your React app 60 times a second, it creates an animation. Um, another cool one is, you may have seen this one around the internet. It's the Pythagoras fractal. This one doesn't use any D3, but it is re-rendering, I think it is up to about 4,000 nodes live, just React driving all of it. And all I'm doing here is every time you move the mouse, I change some props that go into each rectangle and it makes the whole thing animate. Uh, and this one is built with Mobex and with like a declarative canvas approach. And again, not a very useful data visualization, but I think it looks pretty cool. Um, the, what I wanted to tell you here is, the, oh, I have another one. This one is an actual data visualization. Let's see how many people emigrate to the United States every year and you get a visualization where things are moving around and the density of dots is showing you how many people are going in. Uh, and I think the color also indicates the intensity of that country going into the US. Uh, what's interesting is that between Mexico and the US, you have the highest, immigration, the highest rate of immigration in both directions. A lot of Americans are moving to Mexico. I was surprised when I found that out. Um, but let's see, Ethiopia. Some people go to Ethiopia, but not important. Um, <laughs> it's, this is mostly just to show you what kind of things you can build with React in D3 to kind of get you excited because there's, a, there's really a lot you can do. And it makes uh, adding React to your D3 code makes it a lot easier to use, just as adding D3 to your React code makes data visualization a lot easier. <laughs> especially if you at least kind of an, have a working knowledge of how D3 works. Now, this is a, the same bar chart code from, from before, except now it's done as a React component. The, this, um, I, I, said, I used two different approaches, to re, two different ways to combine React and D3. One is this sort of full feature integration, where you use D3 to, rend, to handle your props and your state and you use React to handle your rendering logic, which in theory means that you could use almost the same components to render to Canvas, to SVG, to HTML elements. I've heard some people like to uh, really abuse divs and make data visualizations with those. Uh, you can render to React Native. Uh, basically, anything that React can render to, you could use this approach to make a data visualization because you're just manipulating your props. The way it works is, you create a bar chart component, which has to be a uh, class-based component. You define some basic D3, uh, D3 objects, and it doesn't matter what these scales actually do if you don't know yet. The idea is that you set up your D3 objects, which are going to calculate your props, as your sort of uh, class, inst 
as your object instance variables or whatever this syntax is called. I can never remember it. Then you have to make, keep, make sure that you keep your D3 and your React in sync. I do this with component will mount and component will update so that every time, bef every time I get new props into my component, right before it renders, I use that as an opportunity to update the internal state of my D3 objects. Because the way D3 works is it says that it's a, it does declarative data visualization, but it's not quite as declarative as React because it uses a lot of internal states for all these objects with, uh, chained, with chained functions that you then use to update the internal state to get different results when you call these things again. Which uh, I'm sure we've covered already today that having functions that return different results based on how many times you call them and what kind of accessor, what kind of chained functions you call on them is a bad idea, at least in the React world. Uh, you should always return the same stuff and D3 doesn't do that. So from component will update and component will mount, I tend to call uh, a bunch of D3 spaghetti soup to update my D3 objects. Uh, this, is, this, this is something you can't really get away from. This is how D3 works. You chain a bunch of functions one after another and things, have, things change internally. And when you're rendering all of that, this looks kind of messy because it doesn't fit on the slide very well. Um, but it, it's not as bad. It's not that bad. But the idea is that when you're actually ready to render your bar chart, you're just, you loop through your data in a declarative fashion, just like you're, you would with uh, anything else, and you render bars. Those are like the rectangles that go up and down. And that's basically it. If you look at all this code together for a bar chart component, when I put it on a slide like this, it looks, I hope it looks better than the D3 version did before. Um, it's prettier kind of messed it up and made it look longer than it actually is. Like these const x, y data, this doesn't really have to be all in a new line. Um, but the idea is that you can use these, you can then use these components and I don't have a slide for that. But once you have this bar chart component, you can render it anywhere on your page. You can reuse it, pass it different data, and you get different bar charts with different data and you don't have to look at all of that spaghetti soup that I showed you earlier. But you can make all of this even easier if you use the black box approach. The idea behind the black box approach is that you use React to render a, an anchor element and then D3 takes over and renders the entire visualization into that anchor element using the normal D3 stuff. The way that looks is like this. Uh, I like to use the axis example for this part because D3 has really good support for making char charting axes. And axes, while they look like a very simple component, they are actually really annoying to build yourself because you have to have a line and you have to specifically align every little text, text element and all the vertical tick elements. And then what if somebody wants a logarithmic scale, somebody wants an ordinal, a logarithmic axis, somebody wants an ordinal axis, it just gets really messy. So it's easier to use D3 because you can do it with a single function call. Uh, the way this works is you make, again, a class-based uh, component called axis. In component did mount and component did update, this is different from before where we were calling our D3 code in will update and will update and will, will mount and will update. We now do it after it's already updated in the DOM. And in our render axis function, you, you just call the normal D3 code. Um, this, uh, again, is a little bit of spaghetti soup, but it creates an axis, set, uh, it creates a scale, says that it's gonna be linear, go from zero to 10, uh, render from zero to 200, and then renders it into here, it renders it into a, the anchor element, which we get from refs. D3 select, for, every, for anyone who doesn't know, is very similar to the old school jQuery way. You have a, the dollar, dollar sign and then you rent, uh, write a selector. Similar here, you, you d3.select and write a selector. And your render method is just, just renders a grouping element, which in SVG is similar to the concept of a div in HTML. And uh, then D3 takes over and renders everything. This is a really great approach when you're coding the same way that I've personally liked to code D3 and I think a lot of people where 
You look at your problem and you say, I have no idea how to do this. So you go on the internet and you find an example that looks as close to what you're trying to build as possible and copy paste it into your project. Um, the black box approach lets you do that even if your project is React because you can take the entire example you found online and put it in this function and it's going to render in the, in the context of your React project, which is really nice. It does have some downsides though. Uh, you can make it even, even better if you build a hook out of that basic, uh, out of this basic component. And this is something I've been saying I was, I'm going to release as a library for two years now. Uh, but I'm very bad at open source and I was hoping to finally say at Reactathon that I did it and you can go use it, but I didn't and you can't. <laughs> um, but it makes integrating D3 as simple as this. The D3 black box essentially takes care of all the component, did mount component will, uh, did update and rendering the anchor element. So you just pass it a, ren a D3, ren uh, D3 render function and give control to your D3 code and does everything. With this, uh, in some workshops we've done experiments, you can take a random example from the internet and put it in the context of your React app within like two or three minutes. The hardest part is usually figuring out how to load the data because they, have, they use relative paths for loading uh, data sets. Um, the downside of this, okay, we're gonna get to that. The downside of using this approach is that it is a black box, so React, anything that is lower down than your anchor element, React cannot help you with, um, which means that you get code that can be potentially slow um, you, it's, easy, it's harder to debug. You, have, you still have all the problems with spaghetti code. And I think uh, somebody at the React D3 workshop yesterday said that he came to the workshop because they've been using this sort of black box approach that they built themselves to build a huge product with uh, visualization dashboards. And he is looking for ways to bring render times down to below one second. Um, so that's the downside of this is that once you re-render that component, when React decides, oh, this component needs an update, D3 is regenerating the entire DOM every time, which is why I suggest using the full integration approach I showed you first, or you can use a library. There are a lot of libraries out there from people who are better at open source than I am. Uh, one of those that I think is really cool is from Formidable Labs. Two minutes, okay. Uh, from Formidable Labs, it's called Victory.js. It gives you a very easy way to build a bar chart because you just say, I want, this is a victory chart and it's going to be a victory bar. And it renders a bar chart, which is pretty cool. Uh, one, of my favorite parts of one of my favorite parts of this library is that before you load data in your, into your data viz, it already shows you what the example of that visualization would look like with fake data which makes it very easy to iterate quickly and see what fits your stuff. Another one is recharts, which is cool because everything by default has transitions and moves into the page, but it feels a little bit less professional than victory and is a tiny bit more work to integrate. You have to tell it more stuff, but then from, then on, from there it's pretty simple. Nivo is another good contender for the best library before I make my own, obviously. Um, Nevo has some of the fanciest docs I've ever seen. They, uh, this isn't a screenshot of the docs, but their docs are interactive. You can manipulate a bunch of uh, parameters and see exactly what would happen with your visualization, but it doesn't tell you how to use it. Uh, <laughs> uh, the docs look really great. You can manipulate everything, and when it looks the way you want it to look, you are left with, I will just copy paste this example code that was now generated and hope for the best. Um, but making a bar chart is as easy as calling the responsive bar component. Then you have VXJS, which is my favorite because it gives you the most control. It means you have to do a bit more work. It's very similar to what would happen if you took my, um, my full integration approach with D3 handling da data and props and React handling the rendering and made a library of basic components out of it, which means that you also have to do a lot more work to render a bar chart than with any of the others. 
which is why I suggest you should use a library if what you're doing are basic charts. You do not want to build that from scratch every time you're building something. But the more, the more custom you need to go, the more often it happens that these libraries get in your way. And every single, one, every single library out there that I found that uses React in D3 says the same thing. We give you basic charting components for React. And uh, React plus D3 equals love. You should use them, especially if you're doing data viz. I've been Swizzets. You can find me on the internet. And if you want to learn more about React in D3, you should go to swiss.com slash react d3js. It's about a 250-page book, of which you now saw a 20-minute talk. Thank you.